here. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, give a little bit of background uh, on the, the speaker's topic for today. Uh, you know, I had the pleasure of, of talking to Swamit earlier this week and, and learned a lot uh, from it. It's, it's a topic that I haven't, haven't worked on too much uh, personally, but as we'll see, it's, it's very important and, and very rich. Um, and he also, he, he was uh, kind enough to share some slides from, from his introductory uh, classes um, on, on uh, quantum computing. And I enjoyed the slides so much that I've taken uh, all of them for, for uh, this presentation. So <laughs> uh, these slides are, are from him. Um, so let's get started. Um, let's start by, by asking you know, what, what quantum compilation is um, and, and why it's important. Um, and so it, it, taking a step back, you know, what, is, uh, what is compilation in classical computing? Uh, so if we think about uh, classical computing, um, it's really, it's a full stack problem uh, starting from some high level algorithm um, and working its way all the way down to, uh, to a device, a, a physical a hardware. Um, and there are multiple steps in this stack and, and most of us uh, think about uh, uh, certain, uh, certain areas, but the important is, is to have seamless connection to optimize each of these stages. Um, so the algorithm is something that we write in a, in a programming language, uh, something like C or Java. And, and one of the first things that happens is that that programming, that code uh, gets translated into something that the machine can recognize into some assembly language. Um, and that's the compilation step. Once it's in uh, that uh, assembly language, uh, it can send operations to, to the physical uh, architecture um, and eventually become pulses that, that are, are actually run on the device. Now in quantum computing, um, there really is a very analogous uh, set sequence um, that goes on. And, and again, we, we start from some algorithm. Here, we're not writing it in, in code, um, but we're thinking about uh, uh, programs, um, some, some type of uh, uh, operations, textbook level uh, functions. Um, and eventually we want to, to send this to, to our hardware and, and have our experimental friends run this. But along the way, there, there are multiple steps. And, and one of the most important ones or, or a, key, a key step that we'll see is the process of taking this, this high level algorithm and breaking it down into operations uh, that run on our computer. And, and really finding the optimal set of operations um, and being aware of characteristics of our device is a very challenging problem. And, and that's where the role of, of, of a good compiler comes in. Um, and this is especially important in, in this early stages of quantum computing, where we have just such limited resources at our disposal. Uh, our devices are extremely noisy. Um, they have somewhat limited connectivity. And so figuring out this optimal steps can, can really make or break uh, an algorithm in, in practice. Okay, so let me, uh, let me give a very simple example uh, of, uh, of this process. Um, so let's say our, our algorithm is we wanna prepare a, a two qubit EPR state. Um, and if we look up in a textbook, uh, the way to do this, uh, we can uh, write this down in terms of a few high level operations, uh, Hadamard and, and a C naught connecting those, uh, those qubits. Um, but these operations are not necessarily native to our, uh, to our quantum computer. And so what the quantum compiler will do is it will uh, take these operations and it will break them down into, into smaller uh, operations, ones that can run our device. So our Hadamard becomes a set of rotations um, and our C naught is broken up into some two qubit uh, uh, phase uh, pulses. And eventually these can be uh, uh, transmitted into or uh, expressed as just uh, uh, microwave pulses that, that are actually run on our device. Um, and so this, this intermediate step of taking the, the high level functions um, and converting it into something that our device will be able to easily recognize is the role of the compiler. Um, and this is a very simple example, um, but just to, to give uh, some flavor and, and uh, don't need to go through this in much detail, but there are many steps involved when these, these functions become uh, more complicated. Um, so for instance, we, we might have want to run multi-qubit. Uh-oh, I think Bryce, I think you might be frozen. Um, at least I think, okay, let me. Let me go. I think I know where Bryce is sitting from the blackboard behind him. So let me go check on him and see if he's okay. 
certain set of, of basis gates that, that can run. Um, and so each Price. of these. Price? Yep. I, th I think you just cut out for just a second, actually. So I think we oh, were just I'm about so to sorry. say something about um, higher, you know, multi cubic gates. And then from that point on, I think we didn't hear anything. Sorry. So <laughs> oh, I'm so mind, sorry. Thank you. Have to go back to that. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, just a few a few examples of, of of the different stages that that this compilation might go through. One is breaking down uh, many qubit gates into into kind of few qubit gates. Um, another one is if you have restricted topology or connectivity in our device, uh, figuring out how to uh, to implement uh, a qubit a multi qubit. Um, let's say two qubit operations uh, using the nearest neighbor. Uh, uh, um, operations that, that are native to our device. Um, and another one would be if we, we have some limited set of, of basis gates, some set of rotations that we can do, um, then, and then taking the, uh, the operations that you want and breaking it down into that much simpler gate set. Um, so these are just the many stages that, uh, that are involved in the compilation. And, and really each of these uh, 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 needs to be optimized or, or, or involve some some optimization uh, step in order to uh, to ultimately perform our, our algorithm uh, with the highest fidelity. Um, so let me uh, let me focus on just a, a few uh, a few examples and a few uh, problems that that come up uh, when when designing optimization. Uh, so one of them that I've I've already uh, alluded to is is this problem of of limited connectivity. Um, so shown here would be an example, a you know, fairly uh, familiar example of what uh, a quantum device might look like um, laid out on a, on a two-dimensional grid. Um, and let's say we have an operation that, uh, a two-qubit operation that we would like to, to implement um, on the A and B qubits. Now, as we can see, these are, are not adjacent on our device. And so what we need to do, so there's no, there's no direct connection, but what we can easily do here is swap our qubits around in order to make them adjacent. Um, and so here, in order to implement this uh, next nearest neighbor operation, we can simply swap uh, these two qubits and then perform a nearest neighbor uh, C naught. Um, now one thing, so this is it's easy to see. Um, and so what over our compiler will tell us is, is that this, uh, it will give us a sequence of, C of swaps um, in order to make all of our two qubit operations a nearest neighbor. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that a swap is uh, a physical operation. Oftentimes, it's it's broken down into three C naught gates, and every every operation, especially two qubit operations, uh, incurs some uh, some cost, uh, some noise cost. And so, ultimately, we would like to minimize the number of swaps. Um, these do not come for free, and and can offer uh, can often lead to significant noise overhead if we have. Uh, uh, additional swaps uh, more than than are necessary. Now this is uh, a very simple problem. Uh, if we have a small uh, if we have a small device and 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 just a few uh, operations, but as this problem becomes larger and figuring out what the the optimal mapping is quickly becomes a very challenging problem. And in fact, it's it's a traveling salesman like it's it's an NP hard complexity uh, problem. And so it, it developing uh, um, I mean, it's, it cannot be solved uh, fully, but there's, there's uh, been significant work um, in, in literature in order to come up with, uh, with algorithms, uh, heuristic algorithms, in order to reduce uh, the number of, of swaps that are necessary. So here, for example, if you would like to connect A and B, you know, the optimal path, the shortest distance path, would be along this green and, and not along this red. Um, but if you have a, uh, a higher dimensional uh, a graph, let's say you want to implement something with all to all connectivity, um, then, then you need to uh, be able to route you know, many qubits and, and figure out uh, that process. Um, so that's, uh, that's the problem of, of limited connectivity. Um, and this is, is a simple, you're coming, comes down to, to a minimization problem, a very challenging minimization problem, but, but a minimization problem nonetheless, where um, where, where really our, our, our cost function is, is the number of swaps. Um, now, an additional challenge that comes up um, as, we, as, we start to, uh, um, as we start to implement these it, it, uh, is that uh, one notices that, that uh, our qubits are, are not all created equally and in some operations are much noisier than others or have a much higher probability of failure. 
Um, and this complicates our, our minimization problem now because we need to be aware of which operations um, are, are better than others and, and avoid the ones that are, that are most likely to fail. Um, so if we know that on our device, certain links uh, have a highest probability of failure, our quantum, a good compiler uh, should try to avoid those and, um, and, and that will improve the reliability significantly. Uh, just to give some, so for instance, if, if this uh, swap is much better, then you might want to go along this path than along this path in order for these to meet. Um, <laughs> um, now, just to give some data and to, to, you know, to emphasize why this is such an important problem, here's, here's some, some actual data taken from, from an IBM device. Um, and it's a, a histogram of the two qubit uh, uh, failure uh, probabilities um, across the device. Uh, we can see it's, it's, it's peaked around uh, about 4% uh, here, uh, but there's a wide spread, a wide variability among these, uh, these, these error rates. And, and certain errors can have double or triple uh, the average. And so if you have a compiler or if, if your, uh, your operations are, are, are relying on, on these, these very error-prone uh, uh, gates, um, then, then your overall error budget will... Uh, will um, uh, will deteriorate. Okay, so this this leads to this notion of a, a variational aware uh, compiler. Uh, before we were thinking about just the the high level program in the connectivity map. Now we're going to add a new ingredient, which is really the noise characteristics taken from our device. Um, and in combining now all of these features um, uh, and optimizing is is the role of of these variational qubit um, uh, compilers. Uh, and so now our minimization problem is not just the, the, the number of swaps, but, but also their location. Okay, and finally, the last, uh, the last example that I wanna give um, uh, is, uh, is the fact, so before we are looking at, at the individual noise rates um, among uh, certain operations, um, but another uh, observation um, that, that can be made from our devices is that the, the gates um, are not independent from each other. And so in particular, there's significant crosstalk uh, between, uh, between gates, and this leads to large correlations among our errors. Um, so as an example here, if we uh, write our program um, and we come up with the mapping uh, via our compiler and, and we run this, um, we find that our output distribution, these are, are kind of the, uh, uh, the rate of errors depending on, on the state, um, is not flat. It's correlated um, to, uh, to the state of the, uh, uh, to the state that you're in and, and, and indicates that there's a level of correlation in, in our errors. Um, and, and this is, is something, uh, I mean, uh, our simple error models uh, do not capture this. Um, and so it's something that, that quantum, I mean, we really wanna try to avoid, especially when we're doing uh, error correction, uh, this becomes a very, a very challenging problem and also makes the, the interpretation of our results. It gives a lot of bias in our, in our results. Um, and so one thing the, the compilers can, can help do is, is come up with, uh, with ways of, 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 of mitigating these, these correlations. Um, and one of the ways that uh, has been suggested is by, by using uh, multiple, uh, compi uh, multiple uh, different uh, compilations and, and combining statistically the results. So if we, have, if we map our program onto these four qubits versus these four qubits, and we look at the output distributions the output distributions uh, have, have strong correlations, um, but if we combine them, we can, we can try to reduce that and end up with a less correlated result. And uh, with that, uh, I have uh, reached uh, leave the end of my time, but I think this naturally segues into, into some of the topics which, which Swamit will, will tell us about into, in much more detail. Um, and uh, yeah, so without further ado, I'd like to, to give it over to, to Swamit. Um, he just, uh, a few words of background is a is a new hire professor at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and he's actually in the, the computer science department. Um, and it, his background is is in uh, quantum uh, uh, computing and, and computer architectures, and he received his, his PhD uh, from electrical engineering and computer engineering at uh, at Georgia Tech. Um, so with that I'd like to pass it over. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Bryce. Let me just share my screen. 
thank you so much for the background and the tutorial talk. And thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about some of the things that uh, we have been doing. Um, just give me a second while I navigate the Zoom. Uh, okay, so is my screen visible now? Looks perfect. Okay, awesome. So we want to build quantum computers because we want to solve some of the hard problems that we cannot solve using conventional computers, problems in optimization, simulations. And I think audience knows more than me uh, about what type of problems we can solve and uh, we cannot. So I'll, I'll skip this part, but essentially I'm, I'm, a, I'm a computer architect. I think about quantum computers as an accelerators and I'll, I'll uh, say a little things about what do I mean by accelerator, right? So we computer architects like to call uh, devices like GPUs as domain specific accelerators. So it's a physical piece of hardware specifically built to do certain tasks. For example, if you buy a GPU, GPU cannot run all types of uh, computations or all types of programs. They are specifically designed for uh, these rendering tasks. And nowadays they are, they're being designed for training neural networks, right? So in some sense, quantum computer is uh, an accelerator because uh, it's not doing general purpose, general purpose computation. It's specifically designed and built to do these chemistry problems or uh, optimization problems, or if you want to factor numbers, then uh, that, right? Uh, but there are significant differences uh, also. Uh, for example, we use quantum information when we are doing quantum computing. For all classical uh, accelerators, we don't really uh, worry about how we encode state. It's all uh, classical information. Uh, there is another uh, interesting uh, difference, and that's uh, classical accelerators like GPUs can help us reduce the constant factors. They don't really affect the complexity of the problem, whereas quantum computers have this advantage where we can reduce the complexity for some of the problems significantly. But it also adds this constant factor, and that constant factors comes because of the error correction or some of the background things that we need to run uh, to support quantum computing. And uh, systems researchers uh, are really good at uh, figuring out these constant factors, understanding these constant factors, because they have been uh, sort of trained to uh, spot these type of problems. And uh, my, again, I'm coming from this uh, systems and architecture background, and I'm thinking about how we can help reduce some of these uh, constant factors that we encounter in near-term and long-term quantum computing uh, paradigms. So uh, this is great. Uh, we have an accelerator, which can significantly uh, improve the, uh, uh, improve our ability to solve problems by reducing complexity. But uh, of course, there are uh, problems like uh, you know, uh, quantum errors. So decoherence and gate errors are predominantly stopping uh, our ability to run more and more compute on these quantum computers. Um, and that's why we want to go towards uh, error corrected paradigm where uh, we, we use a collection of uh, these physical devices to build fault tolerant logical qubits, right? And our mantra here is uh, vulnerable individually, tolerant to errors collectively. But uh, this quantum error correction that we want to run and deploy on the quantum computers, it's, it's uh, expensive. We need uh, hundreds of physical uh, qubits to create one logical qubit. And when we are thinking about running a program on a fault tolerant quantum computer, uh, there are several overheads to uh, running this, uh, running these operations, right? And when we are dealing with a large amounts of complexity, typically in systems, we use abstractions, right? So we need some kind of abstractions uh, when we are building uh, quantum computers and Bryce captured it really well. The, uh, I'm, I'm going to reuse this slide because it's really important to acknowledge that if we want to build a large scale quantum system, we need all parts of the stack uh, from algorithms to compilers to architecture to uh, devices. And I think this is, uh, this is kind of a naive picture of quantum stack uh, because we are still trying to figure out 
how we should uh, use this idea of abstraction when we are thinking about building quantum systems. So here is one uh, way of thinking about it, where uh, we just map uh, these uh, stacks one on one, we just add the Q letter in front of uh, every layer and say, well, uh, we are going to build quantum architectures. And that's something that uh, uh, we've been doing moving forward. We probably need like a better model. So I, uh, I'm i going to talk about uh, some of our recent work that we did. So Micro and Asplos are top venues at com uh, for computer architects to publish their work. And uh, many of our papers uh, were featured at Asplos and uh, Micro. So uh, going back to this uh, full stack uh, picture, here is another way of thinking about uh, what all we need to build these uh, large scale quantum computers. And you can see this uh, really complicated diagram, uh, uh, you know, where you have quantum computing theory at the top, uh, interacting with quantum programming, where we need to sort, we need to think about quantum error correction theory, how we build logical qubits, how we build logical gates, and how we express this uh, in programming languages and when we are compiling uh, what type of optimizations we should be using and so on. And at the, at the bottom of this stack, uh, there are several challenges uh, like quantum interconnect technologies and how do we want to build classical control. So uh, I have also uh, worked on projects where we thought about how to build classical control. Uh, and that's also a very interesting area that closely ties to what type of compiler you're building and so on. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, towards the end of my talk. And this is something that is uh, not new because uh, computer architects have been thinking about uh, architectural issues and system level issues in quantum computers for last 20 years. So this is a paper from Kubi uh, in ISCA 2009, they did this really cool study where uh, they showed that by looking at uh, patterns in Shor's algorithm and picking the right quantum adders, we can significantly reduce the uh, ancilla overhead, we can significantly uh, reduce the, num uh, the time to compute and also uh, improve the, uh, the threshold. Right. So this is a really neat way of thinking about uh, these large scale systems and uh, the insights uh, behind uh, this idea were uh, very similar to what we what we would see in a conventional systems uh, uh, conference or conventional systems problem. And the idea is if you use these uh, uh, identical compute pieces uh, and distribute ancilla and compute uh, in this uh, in this manner it might be suboptimal if you add more heterogeneity uh, it it it's great and this is, is this is something that we do with modern processors right we don't use identical uh, uh, cores we we use heterogeneous systems uh, to enhance performance and that's just, that is something that we can uh, you know implement in quantum uh, computing as well so the early works focused on large scale uh, fault tolerant architectures and these studies paved the way for many of us architects to understand uh, uh, big picture problems and in uh, in 2016 2017 when ibm made their uh, uh, quantum platform public, uh, architects and systems and CAD people started thinking about these near-term uh, computers. And one of the good things about uh, the NISC paradigm was machines were already available. We uh, started running some uh, small quantum circuits. And uh, the first question was how do we sort of uh, build a compiler that minimizes errors? Right, and we, we need to minimize errors because on NISC machines, there is no error correction. You can get both the, the correct and incorrect or uh, noise-free or uh, error-prone answers, right? Uh, so you run this uh, circuit, first you compile it, then you run it for n trials and you get this probability distribution. And uh, the goal here is to uh, develop error mitigation uh, protocols, develop error tolerant algorithms and uh, compiler can, can really help in doing that. So uh, part of my uh, pitch was captured by Bryce. So I'll not uh, iterate on that. So I'll, I'll give like a concrete example what, what all we can do. Uh, so again, this uh, same diagram was used 
previously. Uh, so the high level idea here is we go through multiple compiler passes and in every pass, there are opportunities to uh, optimize the circuit, right? We can reduce the gates by using some kind of gate cancellation, uh, uh, gate cancellation algorithms. We can uh, map our uh, compute better so that we avoid these uh, erroneous, extremely erroneous qubits and so on, right? So the, the quantum compilers offer to reduce the gate count. Uh, it, it can reduce the circuit depth uh, by exploiting some of the concurrent operations that you can do. Uh, it also reduces worst case errors by mapping the compute more intelligently. And even at the uh, you know, bottom of the stack, we can do a lot of things. We can uh, build better pulses. Uh, we can integrate all these things together and uh, create a, uh, a, a compiler that looks at uh, multiple different things uh, at the same time. And these ideas have been implemented uh, by Google, IBM, and other companies when they were doing large-scale demonstrations. So for example, if you look at the quantum supremacy paper, there is a supplementary uh, material that talks about how they do compiling. Uh, in quantum volume, recent quantum volume de demonstration, uh, they use several uh, compilation techniques to improve the fidelity. So compilers can really help uh, in the near term and for long term, we, we need to think hard what, what is the role of compiler. So that is something that I'll uh, cover in this talk. So first I'll talk about uh, uh, a topic which is very familiar, might be familiar to uh, uh, might be familiar to you if you have taken a CS class and the, the topic of concurrency, what good we can do with this gate level and circuit level concurrency, what are the challenges uh, uh, in terms of uh, readout crosstalk and uh, other types of crosstalk. So before we start, I just want to clarify that uh, concurrency means ability to do uh, uh, more uh, ability to execute more than one program or task simultaneously that's like a standard computer science definition but for uh, this talk i'm going to relax it a bit and i'm i'm just going to say well concurrency means ability to execute multiple operations simultaneously uh, if this is confusing i i apologize but uh, for simplicity i'm i'm just going to use uh, this definition of concurrency so what is it that we can do uh, with concurrency or how we can uh, leverage concurrency when we are executing circuits? So for example, in this circuit, uh, it's a Bernstein-Vazirani uh, circuit that we want to execute on uh, our, our quantum computer. Uh, as we saw, uh, because of limited connectivity, you need to perform swaps. So in this example, uh, you can perform first three C0 operations as is because all the connectivity requirements are satisfied. Uh, the, uh, the, the map here uh, shows that uh, C0 between two and five, uh, five and three and uh, four and five is possible, right? And the, the last operation uh, to perform that we need to perform a swap. So, we can swap uh, one and four, and after that we can uh, perform the C0 operation, right? Uh, so this is pretty straightforward, but is there a way we can optimize this even further? Can we improve the circuit fidelity by doing some kind of optimization? So one simple thing that we can do is we can move this swap ahead and run concurrently with the C0 operation between three and five. So once we perform C0 between four and five, there is no dependency, so we can move this swap ahead and uh, run it concurrently. By doing this, we can actually reduce the circuit depth significantly. And since swap operations take a long time on fixed frequency type of architectures like IBM uh, machines, uh, they can uh, reduce the uh, circuit runtime significantly. So this gate level parallelism or operational parallelism can be leveraged to uh, reduce the circuit depth, uh, run our programs faster with a higher reliability, uh, and overall it's a big win, right? So this is uh, this is really good and uh, useful. The other type of concurrency that we can leverage in the near term uh, quantum computers is uh, is the circuit level concurrency. And motivation behind that is. 
In the on the NISC hardware platform, uh, we can perform limited number of gates, and uh, our circuit has a limit on uh, the the depth, right? Because errors accumulate, and as this graph shows, it's a very simplistic model. It only assumes gate errors, and if you have uh, two nine fidelity. Uh, the the largest QA that you can run with fifty percent uh, success rate is around uh, is is around few tens of uh, qubits. If you go to better fidelity, of course, you can run larger programs. But in the near term, we expect that we will have more qubits than we can entangle and read out reliably. So uh, we can think of uh, you know utilizing uh, this uh, as as an opportunity because now we may have large number of qubits, but we can only use small subset of these qubits uh, uh, in a coherent uh, manner, right? So one way to uh, leverage this circuit level concurrency is to use uh, this idea of, uh, you know, running multiple copies of your circuit in parallel. For example, let's say you're trying to solve a variational quantum eigensolver. One of the the most tedious step in doing this is to is is to finding these uh, beta gamma parameters or the the ansatz that uh, that uh, you have designed right and it takes a really long time because you need at uh, you need tens of thousands of shots to compute the expected value and then you iterate for uh, maybe million iterations or a thousand iterations depending on the scale of the problem depending on the noise and so on uh, so the conventionally uh, we are when we are thinking about these problems we are saying okay here is my problem i'm going to map one copy run it for n trials get the distribution and repeat the process uh, while other qubits uh, are are not utilized right uh, and one argument for uh, going going towards this direction is well, when we when we are mapping one copy, I can pick the strongest subgraph on this uh, quantum computer because not all qubits are created equal. I can leverage uh, uh, you know this variability and get better fidelity. Uh, but on the flip side, if we can map multiple uh, copies, let's say if we can m copies, uh, we don't have to run. Uh, uh, we don't have to spend time running in trials. We can get this constant factor because now we are getting samples from two uh, two copies in a given uh, unit time. But that also has an effect on how many iterations we need to run. Uh, there are all type. There are there are really interesting problems here because if you map more copies, then you have to use uh, unreliable qubits that adds noise to your circuits. So you can get more samples per unit time, but now these samples may have less fidelity. So it it might influence your training iterations. So for simplistic models, we uh, we saw that the training iterations that you need to do for QAOA or VQE are not significantly different. So if you can map more uh, circuits uh, uh, or if you can map more copies, uh, that, that benefits you. Uh, the other advantage is when you, when you have this correlated error or when you have the correlations in the error, uh, mapping same circuit on different qubits can actually be more robust. You can converge faster. Although this is this is something that I uh, I don't want to claim because we don't have any real data based on the uh, simple models we we observe that we can mitigate bias. Um, so uh, circuit level concurrency can speed up our parameter search and uh, can help uh, run these variational quantum circuits uh, much faster. The other advantage here is. If you have a VQE that runs for two days or three days, there is a lot of drift and uh, you know variation in uh, with with time in some of the uh, the errors, right? So by making uh, making our runtime smaller, we are not only improving the performance, but we are also uh, making this problem more manageable because otherwise uh, there could be a drift that can uh, affect your ability to. Uh, quickly converge on the on the right uh, parameter so circuit concurrency uh, is great the other uh, other thing about, the other uh, thing that can help us in uh, in in circuit with circuit concurrency is the uh, the idea uh, or the uh, the idea of multi programming and the motivation behind that is uh, there is a lot of demand 
there are a lot of en enthusiastic students, grad students, undergrad students who want to run quantum programs, but there are uh, only maybe tens of uh, quantum computers that are available in the world today that uh, you can access freely, right? So there is a big gap between uh, supply and demand. And here is one uh, a data point that, uh, that uh, one of my collaborator, Palomidas, captured. Uh, and that's essentially, uh, you know, pending uh, request or the queuing delay on these IBM machines. So IBM machine, IBM has done a phenomenal job of uh, making these uh, quantum computers open source. Uh, but again, I'm, there is a limit on how, how many uh, users that one uh, quantum computer can serve, right? So uh, there is a problem of queuing delay. And what we can do is we can enable uh, multi-programming by leveraging this uh, circuit level concurrency. And the idea is to improve the throughput utilization and reduce the cost of uh, doing quantum computations. So today, uh, the way we uh, run uh, programs or circuits on IBM machines or uh, other cloud providers, you uh, only one of the circuit is mapped. Uh, uh, let's say there are two users, uh, each user gets uh, their slot and for uh, slot P1, you can map this program P1, uh, user two wants to run program P2, user two gets the chance once the, uh, the, the program P1 finishes, right? Uh, you can see that the in this example, there are uh, four qubits that we are using, but the rest of the qubits are not utilized. And the idea is, can we, uh, can we run these two programs uh, uh, concurrently, right? Uh, there are, there are, there are challenges here, but uh, it's again, it's a very similar idea uh, as virtualization, which uh, cloud providers do uh, in, in uh, data centers today, right? So that increases the throughput, that increases the utilization and reduce the, reduces the cost of compute significantly because we are sharing these uh, resources. The, the last thing that I want to capture about concurrency is uh, concurrency is at the bedrock of quantum error correction. If you want to do uh, something like surface code, you, you, you have to perform these syndrome generation and syndrome measurement uh, cycles concurrently on large number of qubits, right? So it's not that uh, concurrency is, uh, it, it is, a, a luxury, it's kind of a necessity if you want to do quantum error correction. Unfortunately, uh, there are a couple of uh, bottlenecks or there are several challenges uh, when we want to uh, leverage this concurrency. And uh, the, the first challenge that I'll talk about is the readout crosstalk. So uh, on, on this is a data from uh, uh, Google and what we have here is a a measurement that we perform in an isolated mode and measurements that we are performing in a concurrent mode or multiple mode, right? So uh, what we what we see is uh, because of readout crosstalk, uh, the readout error rates increase significantly when we are performing these concurrent measurements. And uh, this crosstalk is not just a problem on Google machine, we observe similar effects on IBM machines too. Right. So this is a data on IBM Toronto machine, uh, and the x-axis uh, here represents the number of concurrent qubit readouts we are performing, and the y-axis shows the relative fidelity for four uh, quantum states. So this is a one qubit state. You are uh, you are generating this cube uh, one qubit state and uh, increasing the number of readouts that you are performing in the uh, uh, concurrent mode. Right. So with increasing uh, number of concurrent qubits, the error rate increases significantly, both on uh, Google machine and also on uh, IBM machines. So why is this a problem? So one of the challenges, uh, one of the uh, the challenges with readout is uh, it's it's significantly slow, and if you want to uh, serialize the readout, that's not an option. Uh, because by the time you perform the first measurement, uh, qubits would uh, decohere, right? So just reading out qubits one by one is, is not uh, possible. So if we have this readout uh, crosstalk issue, that also means when we add more compute uh, or when we have these concurrent measurements, 
because of the additional compute that we are doing uh, in the multi-programming mode, uh, that would reduce the fidelity of both P1 and P2. So this may not be possible. Uh, for error correction, again, uh, we we are expected that we we uh, we are expecting that we can perform these concurrent measurements, but uh, because of crosstalk, again, the error rates increase significantly. Right. So uh, the readout crosstalk is uh, is affecting not just the near term uh, applications or near term circuits, uh, but it can significantly uh, significantly impact our ability to uh, build an error corrected uh, quantum computers. So uh, one observation that we make is if you subset this uh, uh, readout. Uh, I mean, if you read the subset of qubits, you can significantly improve the readout fidelity. For example, in this uh, in this uh, in this figure, we have an input circuit. Uh, we are performing something like uh, a G. We are producing something like a GHG state, and uh, the output distribution is not representative here. Is just an uh, illustrative figure. But one way of uh, solving this problem is to create this uh, uh, you know subset uh, subset circuits right uh, or circuits with partial measurements so on these uh, circuits we are not measuring all the qubits but rather only uh, but rather measuring a subset of uh, qubits and for rest of the qubits we are not uh, doing uh, we are not performing a readout right so what this gives us is we, we get this output distribution in a regular execution mode, but if we have this uh, circuits with partial uh, measurements, then we get marginal distributions. Um, so one thing that we observe on IBM machines is that these marginal distributions can have significantly higher fidelity uh, because there is less crosstalk and there are certain compiler optimizations that you can do when you're just uh, measuring subset of qubits. But there is a challenge, and that is uh, if we are evaluating marginals or if we are uh, reading partial qubits, then we need to reconstruct uh, this joint distribution. And that's, uh, that's hard. Um, for example, here is a, uh, is a simple example. Let's say you uh, create this bell pair uh, and measure this bell pair. And if we do this in the subset mode and uh, we can get these uh, marginals, which is a one qubit readout. And if we just uh, do a tensor product, it gives us a, a, a completely wrong uh, answer, right? So uh, it's we, we want higher fidelity, but we also want this correlation that is exhibited by the uh, original circuit, right? So is there a way we can, uh, we can uh, get both? And that's something that we investigated and uh, we proposed this idea called Jigsaw. And the idea is simple. Uh, for original program that you want to run, uh, for dedicate half of your trials to this global mode where you measure all qubits, and for rest, uh, you can uh, for rest of the trials you can uh, run these uh, partial uh, measurement circuits or CPMs. Uh, as I said earlier, this reduces crosstalk uh, because we are not measuring all qubits simultaneously. In fact, we are just measuring partial qubits. Uh, uh, we are just measuring, uh, uh, you know, some of the qubits. So overall, there is less activity. Uh, so it reduces uh, it, it reduces the errors on an average. The other uh, good thing about uh, these uh, partial measurement circuits is we can recompile some of these circuits and uh, reduce the uh, reduce the worst case errors that we see on uh, on 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 some of the uh, qubit devices. For example, uh, if you map a full circuit, uh, you have to measure a qubit uh, uh, on a particular, you have to measure a particular uh, variable on a particular qubit. If you are only measuring subset of uh, qubits, there are opportunities to uh, map things so that you always uh, measure the most reliable qubit. Right. And these variations uh, is something that we have leveraged in the past, and it can show a significant improvement in the fidelity. So uh, Jigsaw combines this uh, global execution mode and subset execution mode and does a Bayesian update. So I don't want to go through a complete algorithm, but here is a simple example. So we are trying to uh, evaluate 
this three qubit circuit first we run it in a global mode uh, we get this first table and then we run it in a subset mode we get the se second table right and what we evaluate essentially is this uh, these update coefficients uh, which is which asks uh, this question given q1 q0 is 0 0 what is the probability of q2 right so we evaluate these conditional uh, uh, probability uh, probabilities update it in this main table uh, repeat this for all the uh, uh, possibilities and uh, that gives us this um, modified output right and after renormalizing we get to the uh, you know correct answer so what's happening here is the global mode has a really high uh, error rate uh, because of measurement crosstalk and the subset mode gives us a significantly higher fidelity marginal estimates and we are using these marginal estimates to shape the uh, global uh, global mode or shape the global probability distribution and there exists this trade off between uh, correlation and fidelity. If we go from uh, subset size two to subset size three, we add more correlation, but there is a higher, there could be a higher crosstalk, right? So uh, we evaluate this idea of using heterogeneous uh, measurement circuits uh, where we, we not only use two, three, four, and uh, we have a we have we have a way of detecting what's the uh, what's the uh, point where we, we need to stop. And by using the, these ideas, we can, uh, uh, we can improve the application or circuit fidelity uh, even uh, more than what Jigsaw can achieve. So on an average, uh, we improve the uh, fertility by uh, 3x on IBM Toronto. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Swami, I think you cut out for most of the last slide. Oh, OK. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just. Bryce, quickly. I think that was just you. I think, I think that was just you, Bryce. All right. OK. Sorry, sorry. Continue. You were cutting out earlier, too. I actually heard it. So um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Continue then. No worries. OK. Yeah, no problem. So uh, I'm glad I did not repeat that part. Uh, uh, so yeah, on average, we improve the uh, the fidelity by 3x. In the best case, like you know, a simple circuit like bernstein Vazirani, we see uh, a significantly higher improvement, uh, which is which is obvious. Uh, but for more complicated uh, circuits like QAOA, we still see uh, some improvement in the fidelity. So this idea of uh, measurement subsetting to avoid crosstalk can be useful, and we evaluate it on uh, more machines uh, uh, because we could we could uh, run things on IBM Toronto, Paris, and Manhattan. Right. The next thing that I want to talk about is the this uh, crosstalk problem between gate and qubit, and uh, it's different than the quantum gate crosstalk, which uh, which have been studied really well for the last couple of years, at least in superconducting architectures. Um, and uh, there, is, there, is, there is some work on how we can uh, reduce crosstalk by modulating concurrency and characterizing uh, this crosstalk. Uh, in, in, the, in this paper uh, that, uh, that we worked on, we focused on a different problem. And this problem is uh, uh, slightly different. Uh, we are uh, we are calling it idling errors for sake of uh, uh, you know simplicity. I like explain what that what that is. The idea is uh, you know you have decoherence even when you are not doing uh, operations, uh, which is uh, which is kind of a fundamental limit for these NISC devices. But on top of that, uh, if there is a concurrent C naught operation or a two qubit operation happening, we see a, a 10x increase in the uh, decoherence errors. And we see this on uh, IBM machines uh, specifically, right? Uh, so why is this a problem, right? Uh, because on many NISC on many NISC applications, uh, you have to perform these swap operations, and swap operations create this uh, data dependency that increases the idling of uh, certain qubits. In this example, uh, a single qubit gate like uh, Hadamard gate, you can perform in tens of nanoseconds, but when you are performing sequence of swap operations, this qubit 
uh, stays idle for a couple of microseconds. And these idling periods increase significantly as you increase the uh, size of your cell. And this is, uh, this is again, this goes back to uh, how good your compiler is in uh, reducing the circuit depth but even with a very aggressive optimizations for certain circuits, we see large idling periods. And when we have these idling periods uh, concurrent to swap operations, which are uh, which can be decomposed as C0 operations, we see a significant increase in the uh, qubit error rate, especially uh, if you have phase, right? So uh, dephasing uh, accelerates when you have these concurrent uh, operations. So. One way to uh, reduce this defacing is to use dynamical decoupling, which is again a standard technique that uh, uh, experimentalists use. Um, and good thing about dynamical decoupling is it doesn't change the program uh, semantics because it acts as an ideal gate, right? Uh, so uh, uh, a, com a compiler can do really simple optimization. Whenever there is an idling period, we can just insert these uh, XY, XY or XX type of uh, decoupling sequences. So dynamical decoup uh, decoupling can, uh, can keep these qubits active, uh, prevent uh, uh, the defacing errors, and that's something that we see on IBM machines also, right? So for example, uh, this the, the top circuit uh, is something that we use to, to characterize uh, this qubit Q0, uh, where we, uh, we rotate this qubit, keep it idle, uh, for uh, four microseconds and then invert this qubit and uh, uh, read it back. If you, uh, if you repeat this process, you get this data uh, for different uh, uh, rotation angles and without dynamical decoupling, we see a significant drop in fidelity of uh, Q0. Now, if you repeat the same experiment with uh, DD sequence inserted in this idle period, we can recover this fidelity and uh, uh, improve the uh, program fidelity in general. So here is some more data. Uh, so this data uh, this data shows that with DD, we shift towards uh, higher fidelity. Uh, so using dynamical decoupling on uh, for these NISC uh, circuits can, can help us uh, reduce some of these uh, effects. But it's not that dynamical decoupling always helps. There are instances where uh, dynamical decoupling can reduce uh, fidelity. And even if these instances are isolated, if the, the worst case error rate uh, goes up uh, significantly, uh, uh, if it goes up significantly, then uh, a small uh, parts of your circuit can have really large errors and those uh, errors can spread out with the next operations that you perform, right? So that's why I'm, uh, you know, I'm categorizing this type of crosstalk as ugly crosstalk because there is no way we can uh, hide behind it. I mean, uh, in operational crosstalk, at least we can modulate the concurrency, uh, move our operations and do something. Here, uh, idle period, idle qubit uh, is, is uh, accumulating errors. And uh, if you're not careful, this error can spread in the, in the circuit because of the next set of entangling operations that you are performing, right? Um, so how does this uh, impact uh, the application or circuit level fidelity? So to understand that, we did this really simple uh, experiment. So we applied dynamical decoupling on some of the qubits, and uh, then you know we went from uh, no dynamical decoupling to dynamical decoupling on all qubits. So for a six qubit circuit, there are uh, two to the power six or 64 uh, possibilities. We just wanted to understand if, uh, if we see uh, any specific patterns in application fidelities. So we ran uh, quantum Fourier transform and bernstein Vazirani, and we see that uh, fidelity of the circuit varies significantly, uh, especially for QFT6 uh, with, the, with the pattern that you are using, right? So x-axis here uh, captures the uh, a binary pattern, uh, for example, 63 is all ones. That means we are applying dynamical decoupling on all qubits. Zero is all six zeros. So we are applying, uh, we are not applying dynamical decoupling on any of the qubits. For intermediate patterns, we can uh, uh, we can figure out where, what we are doing, right? So for example, uh, for 15, 
we are applying dynamical decoupling on uh, Q0 to Q3. We are leaving uh, Q4 and Q5 uh, and not applying anything. So uh, there is a best sequence, and we see this. Uh, uh, we see this for several circuits that it's it's sometimes uh, you know significantly better than applying dynamical decoupling on all qubits right in this example the best sequence was if you apply de decoupling on q1 and q3 it maximizes the fidelity for rest of the uh, qubits it can actually hurt and uh, decrease the fidelity so precise characterization of this type of effect is hard. I Again, I'm not an experimentalist, but we, we try to understand why this effect uh, happens and is there some, uh, is there a systematic way of understanding it? At least we, we were not very successful. So, uh, uh, but I, I believe one of the challenges that, uh, that creates this problem is there are just too many possibilities. Right. For example, we we observe this one uh, one instance where if we perform C naught between uh, one of the physical qubits, the idling error rate significantly increases on one qubit, but for the other qubit, it has no impact. We tried to see if there is some relation between the uh, resonant frequencies, uh, qubit resonant frequencies, coupler resonant frequencies, um, and we were not very successful in explaining why why this happens. Right. But the other example is there are certain uh, you know concurrent gates that uh, impact qubits, but if you do isolated C naughts, like you know in this case, uh, uh, there is no uh, increase in uh, error rate for uh, either zero or one. But if you have concurrent gates, if you are doing two gates simultaneously, uh, the error rate significantly increases, right? And the, the characterization becomes hard as you increase the number of qubits, as you increase the couplers and so on, right? Um, the other way to uh, solve this problem or at least think about this problem is to uh, just apply dynamical decoupling and see if it improves the fidelity or not. Right. For small circuits, uh, it's probably fine because we can simulate the circuit and figure out what's the uh, right answer or what's the uh, correct distribution. But as we increase the, uh, the circuit, it's really hard to, to say which is better, right? which, which uh, output probability distribution is closer to ideal or uh, noiseless uh, distribution. Um, so we don't know the correct output and that also uh, creates a problem uh, to test out what's the right uh, dynamical, dynamical decoupling sequence that we want to use. Uh, but not all uh, circuits are hard to simulate, right? Um, and uh, we can leverage this fact. And the other fact that we can leverage is uh, most of the crosstalk is generated by these C0 gates. So if we can create a decoy circuit, uh, which we can simulate efficiently, but which has identical C0 gates, then we can probably capture some of these idling error patterns and use decoy circuit for testing and uh, to figure out what's the right uh, dynamical decoupling sequence for a given input circuit. Um, so how do we create decoy circuits? So one of the, the simplest way to create a decoy circuit is you take an input circuit, just delete all the single qubit rotations, you're left with two qubit gates, and that's your decoy circuit. It's not really useful because uh, it doesn't have phase, so you cannot uh, capture the dephasing part of the idling errors, and uh, it, it, it doesn't really work, right? So all zero output is not good. Uh, we can use Clifford decoy circuit. So we can use something like operator norm to figure out what's the closest decoy to my non, uh, closest Clifford gate to my non-Clifford gate and replace those non-Clifford gates with the closer, uh, closest Clifford gates. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if we use this rule-based idea, again, there are instances where uh, we can end up with uh, the similar problems as trivial decoy circuit, or sometimes we can uh, we can get uh, you know really large uh, we can get circuits that produce a large entropy circuits, right? So we get this extreme entropy, and there could be issues. So uh, we can, we can slightly relax our uh, criteria on what could be a decoy circuit. So uh, one way to uh, do that is to use a seeded decoy. And here, what we say is uh, keep the first layer of non-Clifford gates uh, and the last 
layer of non-clifford gates as is and in between you can have uh, these uh, clifford you in between you can use the uh, clifford gates or uh, essentially uh, you have this circuit where most of your gates are uh, clifford gates but there are some non-clifford gates and that gives us uh, uh, rich state evolution that's something that that we want in uh, when we are testing these uh, idling errors uh, so by using these seeded decoy circuits we can uh, we can find out what's the uh, what's the slot idling slot where we if we apply dynamical decoupling we can improve the application fidelity and we test this idea with uh, small uh, circuits that we could run on ibm machines so our our design is called ADAPT. Uh, it actually performs a greedy search because when you are searching for the best possible dynamical decoupling slots, again, the, the possibility scales exponentially with the idling slots you have. So we, we employ like a, a, a simple greedy search. And that's why you see this runtime best bar here. Uh, so on average, we uh, improve the fertility by 60%. Uh, the optimal DD sequence uh, always outperforms DD on all qubits. So again, uh, this is a good example where uh, adding some intelligence to the compiler can help us uh, significantly. Um, and this is independent of dynamical decoupling protocol. So we, we tested this with uh, two protocols, XY4 and XX, and uh, we can, uh, we, one can actually implement even more sophisticated uh, protocols. But there is a trade-off if you increase the number of uh, single qubit gates in this protocol, then the slots that you can fill uh, also reduces. So uh, I think that's that's kind of an interesting problem uh, to, to look at which is the right DD protocol to use and uh, can we add even more intelligence to this uh, compiler so that we can avoid this gate uh, gate qubit crosstalk uh, issues. So, so far we uh, looked at the how uh, readout crosstalk and uh, operational crosstalk are uh, uh, prevents us from leveraging this concurrency. The other challenge with concurrency is uh, how do we scale up this system, right? Because uh, one thing that we often, uh, or uh, we as in computer scientists don't really appreciate is the complex, how complex these experimental setups are, right? And this is a picture from IBM and uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, a schematic from, from ETH that shows that we have to worry about uh, wires, we have to worry about these control signals. And when you have uh, highly concurrent uh, programs or when you are executing these highly concurrent uh, circuits, uh, you have this uh, notion of duty cycle, right? And your duty cycle is very, very, very high. And uh, what happens is uh, because you're always operating, there could be, uh, you know, a limit on how many wires you can uh, you can run from this room temperature to the the cryogenic temperature, uh, because you have these attenuators uh, in in the dilution uh, refrigerator, and if there is an uh, if your active heat load is overwhel overwhelmingly high because of the higher duty cycle, the number of qubits that you can support. Uh, uh, decreases, right? So with the increasing concurrency, the number of qubits that we can support can also decrease. So uh, the concurrency is, is a piece that is not, uh, uh, is not fully uh, understood or appreciated by even the architecture community uh, uh, in, in from the quantum context and I think there are some re there are some really interesting uh, problems. So, for example, let's say we have this uh, duty cycle issue, and if you want to run surface code, uh, there might be an upper bound on how many qubits uh, we can support. Um, of course, there are several other issues, but uh, once we fix the uh, gate level issues, uh, should we be worried about uh, these type of problems? Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm really uh, excited about uh, these type of issues and. Uh, we are trying to understand what we can do in compilers, what we can do in software to mitigate some of the some of the problems. So, in the near term, uh, I think uh, we we are we have to develop software and uh, hardware techniques uh, to mitigate errors. So, hardware here means we we need better devices. Software is uh, compilers and uh, you know pulse level compilation and so on as we 
move forward, we, we probably need to think about the scalability. And as we go towards more and more qubits, uh, if you want to uh, demonstrate fault tolerance, we, we probably need uh, new abstractions. And all these pieces are connected to this, uh, uh, you know, a computing stack, right? When we want to go towards this thousand qubit system, we, we have to think about all the pieces in, in this in this stack. So uh, I, I'll, I'll conclude my talk uh, by saying this operational concurrency is essential. Uh, and I think there are many things that uh, device uh, level optimizations can do, but at the same time, software can also help. Uh, concurrency uh, is limited by this crosstalk and there could be you know, interesting ways of uh, reducing this crosstalk using compiler optimizations um, and, uh, and uh, uh, Compiler and architectural optimization. So, so in, 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 uh, at the end of this, uh, uh, I, I just want to say that you know, systems community can help uncover, understand, and analyze these uh, concurrency problems, and uh, we can we can make a lot of progress by thinking about uh, some of the long term problems uh, uh, problems now. So. Thanks for giving. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity, um, and I, I'm I'm really looking forward to the discussion and questions. And uh, if you have any feedback, if you have any pointers, we really uh, I, I'll, I'll I appreciate uh, your time. Yeah. So, what's our protocol for questions? Yeah, well, thanks so much. Um, I think the the first period uh, we open it up to uh, to everyone in the audience uh, about twenty minutes, um, and then after that uh, we have a uh, a kind of uh, undergrad and, and grad student only session. Uh, so we ask the, the the more senior members to <laughs> uh, uh, to remove themselves, and, and then we can have a little more informal conversation. Great. So I have a I have a question. Whenever you. Uh... Or do you want to do the first one, Bryce? It's up to no, you. No, no, go ahead. No, please. Anyone, anyone should, uh, yeah, raise their hand or or just uh, start talking. If, yeah. So, um, good talk. Thank you. Um, I I had a question. Um, so several of your techniques. Uh, so um, both the DD technique and uh, sort of the the jigsaw subsetting techniques um, seem like they are responses to types of imperfections in the underlying uh, hardware. And, um, and in particular, the, the dynamic decoupling seems like there's at least two completely unrelated things. One's about idling because mm -hmm. of the, the, uh, the circuit you're trying to do. And the other is some hard to define crosstalk thing that you're you're experimentally kind of simulating to figure out exactly what it's about right so if the so i guess my question is if the hardware to, were to improve uh and you can define what that means uh would several of these techniques be less necessary or perhaps easier to to accomplish right uh yeah i think that's a great question so uh, for crosstalk, we observe this uh, uh, problem across uh, technologies, right? Um, so there could be a weird crosstalk that, uh, as you said, uh, could reduce because we understand devices better. We can employ some of the pulse uh, level techniques or uh, even design better readout protocols. So in that scenario, uh, something like just jigsaw uh, can still help because uh, what Jigsaw is getting this benefit because of the compilation step that we can perform when we are doing the subsetting. So there is a lot of variability in readout errors. There is a bias in readout errors, and when you are measuring just two qubits, you can we can anchor those two qubits and recompile your program uh, so that overall uh, readout fidelity is increased significantly. So let's say if variability goes to zero, uh, if there is no crosstalk, yeah, in that scenario, uh, the idea that I just presented may not be very useful. Um, but the other uh, angle to Jigsaw is, uh, if we have this crosstalk and if we have variability, can we use some of these ideas when we go to error correction uh, 
regime, right? Uh, should we measure all ancillary qubits simultaneously, or uh, is there a way we can uh, add some kind of serialization because of the uh, you know slack that error correction gives us? Uh, can we leverage some of the uh, the things that uh, we can do at the decoder level and co-optimize the decoder and the readout strategy? So uh, that would be my uh, yeah. One, and if you could comment on the dynamic decoupling too. So it seems when you started it, it seemed like, well, you just put it in the places where the bits are sitting around for a long time and you can compute that because of parallelism. Right. But then it got more complicated pretty quickly. And so could you comment on why just looking at the, um, you know, looking at how long a bit's sitting around and just sort of taking care of bits uh, that are sitting around for a long time, it, it seems like it got more complicated. And I thought that was interesting. And I wonder if you could comment. Right. So I think there is, uh, uh, again, there is a lot of work on uh, the spectator effects and uh, sort of what's the state of my neighboring qubit and how it affects my uh, error rate. Uh, so I think there are these really uh, weird effects that, that creates this complication. Uh, and it's really hard to characterize uh, uh, because of uh, uh, be because of the uh, because of these effects and also uh, the drift associated with this, these devices, right? So uh, the uncertainty in uh, in uh, uncertainty in th these effects kind of uh, drives most of the dynamical decoupling work that, that we did. Otherwise, it's just really easy, right? You characterize, you figure out, and then you orchestrate your computation so that you avoid these idling errors. Uh, but there is this runtime aspect to it uh, that, that we need to understand better. Swamit, so maybe just a, a, a super quick question. So you emphasize this issue of crosstalk, and I had just a very naive high-level question. So certain, um, depending on the platform, sometimes, you know, all to all connectivity or different flavors of connectivity are kind of natural. And I might worry that on the one hand, for these platforms that have all to all connectivity, crosstalk is going to be even a harder issue to manage because you have this connectivity. But at the same time, something you and Bryce both emphasized is that, you know, connectivity matters in terms of, you know, concurrency broadly, but also just like, the ability to you know move things with swap gates in a very short path is there a sense for whether or not the scaling with the connectivity ultimately is better you know like from the perspective of you want more connectivity because the scaling with respect to the number of swap gates is going to out benefit the sort of you know worry that one has about you know crosstalk issues in these types of situations or is the is it the opposite that actually having you know, slightly less connectivity ultimately is better once one thinks about really large scale systems? I think that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, so IBM did a lot of work on this part, at least from a superconducting uh, architecture perspective. And they, uh, so initial machines had like a higher connectivity and now they are moving towards this heavy hexagonal connectivity where uh, the number of uh, couplers are reduced, but that is giving us net benefit in terms of crosstalk. So for error correction, I think you need nearest neighbor connectivity, but you can do clever things and use uh, a sparser uh, connectivity. So uh, I, I think there is this tension between more connectivity because having more connectivity, as you said, introduces more crosstalk, but it also reduces number of swaps. And the other point that I want to make here is when we go to error correction, error corrected regimes, uh, swaps, the, the way we move data could be significantly different as compared to how we are doing it today on the, the NISC uh, type of machines, right? We may or may not require swaps if, uh, if you pick the right uh, uh, error correcting uh, uh, code. I see, okay, thanks. So actually, and another thing I think has been pretty clear from computer architecture communities over the years is that uh, as you scale, you, you just, there's no way to do all at all. I mean, it's just, you need a lower dimensional uh, connectivity and, you know, it just, just looking at existing chips, they're, you know, their meshes, uh, you know, you buy your latest Intel processor, it's a mesh. So 
Um, you know, maybe a mesh is not quite ideal for a quantum thing, but may maybe it's a slightly higher dimensional thing, but it's, it's definitely not going to be all to all, I would say, as well, to just echoing what Swamit was saying. Makes sense, makes sense. Subayan had, had a question. Uh, I did actually, but yeah, thanks for the nice talks and the introduction to the area. So I, my first question is actually probably very naive. And uh, so you spoke about like, if you have, let's say the qubits sitting at a distance, you make, you swap them to bring them close to each other and then allow for nearest neighbor interactions and do a, a gate, apply a gate on it. So I was sort of thinking instead of doing that, because when you sort of do the swaps, you would eventually need a circuit of depth n by two. So if the distance n apart, you sort of swap with time and you need n by two steps to get them close to each other. Instead of that, if suppose I were to sort of suggest a protocol where I say, well, I'm going to first uh, have, uh, I'll do a fancy teleportation circuit, essentially. What I do is from here, I just sort of, I allow for all qubits to exchange entanglement, do a, some, do some, uh, something called entanglement swapping. And in the step two, I, everything is connected. And then I just teleport the, my system here. So that way I can have like some three or four depth circuit. And most of it, or most of the overhead goes to classical communication when I do still have to fix something here. So if I were to suggest that protocol, like one is this sort of already studied and considered and is this particularly better than others? Right. So. Uh... To distribute the entangled uh, sort of EPR pair, you still need to perform certain number of swaps, right? Uh, well, no, uh, that's where we do something called entanglement swapping. And the idea, okay. imagine these two stations have entanglement between them. These two stations have entanglement between them. And I'm going to make a bell measurement on these two things. So right. what will happen is these two stations are going to get entangled and sort of sort of, and you sort of build this little chain of things. And what you have to do is at the end of the day, everybody sends their bell measurement uh, answers or the bell measurement outcomes to one of the stations. You take a global parity and you sort of say, oh, I'm gonna just do one Pauli X or Y or Z. Right, so if, if we have that type of uh, uh, you know, ability on native, to, native on our hardware, probably there are interesting trade-offs, but on existing machines, at least, uh, you know, the, the, the way to move data is, uh, you know, using these swap operations, right? So if we, if hardware supports that, yes, we can probably think about protocols mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, even more sophisticated and uh, we can use something like a, you know, teleportation network. Uh, so a couple of computer architecture papers actually talk about the uh, trade-offs between doing performing swaps uh, using teleportations and even when we go to uh, you know error correcting uh, type of architecture there is there is an idea of breeding so all these data movements kind of uh, become like a really interesting design space uh, exploration problem yeah because uh, you're swapping all the way i so uh, in in on uh, on realistic circuits uh, essentially there are multiple states that you you need to manage right so it's not just you have two uh, uh you know qubit states so uh, when when you are moving something you are uh, moving something else and that that kind of causes a problem so that's why we use these uh, heuristics to keep track of uh, which swaps we want to insert and how they impact the future computation and so on right so once you solve the problem for two interactions you can use a sorting network to sort of, uh, uh, essentially what you're trying to do is induce a permutation. So you can use a sorting network and sort of run a classical subroutine where you decide how to get things next to each other with minimal steps. And- uh, Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think these are all uh, uh, really good ideas. And uh, when we are thinking about an application and the hardware platform, depending on what are our capabilities, uh, that we like, for example, if this type of operation is supported, yes, it becomes a really interesting uh, sort of a trade-off uh, issue, right? Uh, also yeah. generality, right? Because all I'm, so I can, I think without, uh, if we sort of, sort of write things out, we can show that if you like, with back of the envelope calculations, you can show that if you're willing to compromise half of your qubits as like these ancillary systems, which would help you do the computation, 
and you allow for you can construct this teleportation like protocols and i i don't immediately see like if they should be i i would want to think they would be better off than doing the swap because every swap operation you need three c nodes anyway right yeah and sort of swapping between one extreme to other extreme and i'm thinking of a 1d chain the problem is going to be you have to you, uh, go at least n by two steps so maybe you bring this one closer and this one closer one step two step three step four step and so on but with this teleportation the entanglement swapping technique you'd probably just get so entanglement swapping is like generation one step well measurement two step fixing third step so this is this could significantly uh, speed up like lower the depth of the computation but of course uh, the number of gates you would apply is still probably the same so you don't want to get away from the size because here while you swap this so others are resting here yeah. everything happening in parallel all so, right i think i think this conversation maybe is getting a little more complicated then <laughs> yeah so i think we move on to the next question i will point yeah. out that the paper that he referenced looking at char's algorithm and an ion trap situation actually uh, actually had a teleportation distribution network uh, in it as part and what we found was in the local area you still want to do kind of simple swapping and so on but when you get much farther then the teleportation makes sense but um, the one thing i wanted to add is even if you're building these teleportation networks um, you got errors that build up and so you at minimum have to do some sort of uh, teleportation distillation in addition to sort of take several uh, EPR pairs and distill them into a good one and so there's that any distance involved runs into that as well so these these networks are certainly what we're going to want over really long distances but they're not quite as simple as just setting up one permutation I mean, there are there are some things. I'd be happy to chat with those as well. It's the um, Shores paper. Um, I I could put it in the chat if people wanna wanna see it. I will do that. All right, and let's go on to another question if that's okay. Sure. And I'd love to chat with you more about this, uh, Sylvian, if you want. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Ryan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, hey, Solomon. Thanks for the talk. Uh, Hi, Dan. Just. This is uh, just like a high level forward looking question, I guess, going, it relates a little bit to what Norm asked about connectivity earlier, I guess, but uh, thinking about like larger systems and uh, like how these likely, depending on the platform or how it's made, but a lot of, they're very likely to be like modularized, right? Where you have some number of qubits in some module and they're interconnected in some way. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that because then you you may have this like different like a sort of one more dense connectivity within the modules but then you have like sparser connectivity between the modules i was just wondering if there if you have like thoughts or if there's been like uh work that you're aware of or, or kind of where that type of uh problem is being addressed right yeah i think there is uh there is some work on on that type of problem uh but uh, in my opinion, I think it depends on what you want to do. Uh, again, if you want to run error correction, the uh, design space is completely different as opposed to if you want to run QAOA. Uh, so for what type of application, this type of uh, you know, heterogeneous connectivity makes sense. So there, is, there was this recent paper uh, in, in uh, one of the architecture conferences um, called ISCA, where uh, the I think the paper was from IBM and UCSB where they with where they were building uh, like a quantum chip to uh, uh, do uh, chemistry problems right and for some of the chemistry problems you can do pruning and reduce the uh, amount of connectivity that you need uh, in the the algorithm itself right of course that has an impact on your uh, algorithmic accuracy but it can significantly improve your experimental accuracy so uh, this type of uh, idea where you have sparse connectivity uh, in certain regions and dense connectivity in certain regions actually can be very powerful and you can leverage it uh, for a specific type of applications like uh, you know what the authors did in that paper and uh, if, if you if you're not able to find that paper just email me i can send you the paper yeah well, yeah thank you yeah. 
Great. Uh, any any other questions? Uh, if not, um, nope. Yep. Pardon? Yeah, I, I have a question, and so you had this jigsaw method to um, mitigate some of the correlated readout errors. So in terms of quantum error correction, and, and it relied on, on sampling uh, of doing different kinds of measurements to get at the same information. But I wonder what to do in the case if you want to do quantum error correction. And this is where we really need the high fidelity readout. Otherwise, we can always like um, come up with some sequence where you do quantum gates and then you do, well, you can do this always. But, Anyway, so the high fidelity readout, I think we really need for quantum error correction. And there you need to do a single shot readout. So have you thought about what to do in this case? Because um, I think that the jigsaw method actually is not going to work then. Great, yeah. Uh, so one, one, one of the things that I was thinking about is, uh, can we build decoders uh, that are aware of the crosstalk itself? Uh, and can we use that information when we are decoding errors? Um, that's something that we are exploring, uh, but I don't have any like very concrete ideas, but yes, you're right. Uh, the ideas like Jigsaw uh, may not work as well when we are doing error correction. Um, and there is, a, there is a big trade-off between uh, you know, amount of correlation that you get and the, the fidelity that you lose. And for error correction, I don't know how that trade-off looks like because I have not, I mean, we can assume some models, but I have not seen any data on, uh, you know, uh, somebody running an error correction and getting these uh, syndromes, uh, syndromes out. So uh, once we have like, you know, ability to do probably a, uh, one logical qubit, even in a small way, we can we can run these experiments and try to understand what type of crosstalk we see, how it in, impacts the uh, logical error rate, how it uh, how do we observe this on the uh, physical syndrome measurement level, and then when then maybe we can think of uh, some of the decoding strategies, how to solve this problem. I, I I don't know. That's that's a really that's a really good question. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I could imagine that maybe you can do apply some unitary to kind of tilt the crosstalk in a way that it doesn't affect too much. Your, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But it, it does seem like moving into the realm of error correcting is going to require. Uh, no pun intended, well, maybe pun intended, quantum leap increase in uh, ability to, to uh, measure, right? I mean, that's going to be, you know, continuous lots of measurements are probably going to be necessary and they're going to need to be done in a way that uh, doesn't interfere with each other since you're error correcting all the time. So that, that seems like that's a whole new domain that we aren't anywhere close to yet. Right, yeah. Naively, one wrong measurement, and you're screwing up your whole qubit. Right. <laughs> so it, it is interesting to start trying to um, see how little measurements you need. I, I, I like that idea. I think we're going to need a lot more than we currently have, whatever it is. Great. I think we're on to the uh, student uh, time period, or what, what's the time on that price? Yeah, yeah, I think I think now's a good time to transition. So uh, I think ev everyone but professors is, is invited, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> well, thanks for giving us the talk, Swamit. Uh, we'll, we'll be in uh, contact um, chat yeah. a little bit later. But, thanks right. so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.